continue our series in uh, the book of James. And if you were with us last week, we were talking about the tongue, that uh, sometimes our tongue can get us in trouble. Right? It's, a, it's a small member of our body, but it's connected to one of the biggest parts of our body, it's our heart. And the Bible talks about that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so James had us uh, some wisdom. And this week I said we're going to continue this, uh, kind of continue this thought pattern, but we're going to ask the question of how do we get this wisdom? So if last week we, needed, we said we needed a heart change, then this week we're going to say, okay, where do we get this heart change? How do we, how do we receive this wisdom so that our speech is pure, that our life is pure, that our, the, the way that we act, what, what we do in our life, it flows from a heavenly um, perspective instead of a worldly perspective. So this morning, let's uh, look at the word. We're in James. Uh, it's a book right after Hebrews. And we're looking at chapter 3 today, verse 13 through 18. So we're in James chapter 3, looking at 13 through 18. So let's read this this morning. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by the deeds done in humility, that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitterness, envy, and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find discord and disorder and every kind of evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, Considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap in harvest of righteousness. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray and I ask that your Holy Spirit would be present with us, that we would receive from you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are one that reveals truth. So God, I pray that our hearts would be open, that our ears would be attentive yes. to what your spirit is speaking to us today. Father, that we would receive from you heavenly wisdom, not earthly wisdom that would be full of all sorts of evil, but Father, heavenly wisdom that comes from above. We pray this in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. So I was thinking, if you're here this morning, if you, I, I believe that you're seeking after Jesus, that you're wanting to receive from him, you're wanting wisdom. And so what we're going to go through is, is a three, um, three questions this morning. One is, why do we want wisdom? What, what is the motive behind us gaining wisdom? Why wisdom? Secondly, what will wisdom produce in our life? What does, it, what does wisdom, when we get it, what does it produce in our life? We need to know these questions. And then three, where do we get wisdom? How do we get, where do we get this wisdom from? The one that's going to produce in us this good fruit. Because if you're like me, and I believe we're all this morning lovers of Jesus, you read that second list, wisdom that comes from heaven, and you're like, I want some of that. I, I want it produced in my life. I, I need some of that good fruit that, that, that's pure, that's peace-loving, that's considered, that's submission. And, and, and it, if you're in this room and you say, yes, Jesus, I want you, you're saying, yeah, I want that good stuff. I think the other list is pretty easy. I don't want discord and disorder in my life. So let's uh, look this morning first. Uh, why do we want wisdom? What is the motive behind the, our pursuit of wisdom? What motivated us? What, what motivates us to work and to get education? What, what is the passion that's pushing you to chase after wisdom? Why, why is it that I'm going after What is the motivation behind this? You know, it's no... Um, there's no hidden fact that Madison is definitely a, a very educated city. So it's, it's a city that's always it's going after wisdom. That's, you know, we have uh, even PhD um, people that are going uh, after their PhD. You know, that's, that's expanding uh, human wisdom. That's going after more uh, education. And so we're a very driven culture. There's a lot of new startups here, even in Madison, with all of the uh, different medical, uh, biological things that are happening. I, I know of a, a friend that, that moved here just so they could they could start some uh, or join a team starting a biochemical chemical company. You know, there's a, there's all these new things happening. There's there's pushing the envelope. There's going after the these new adventures. There's gaining more wisdom. But what we have to be careful of in our lives, right, is that we're going after that we're seeking that we have the right motives. Why is it that we're going after these wisdom things? 
that James uses, and um, if you read it in the ESV or, or even the King James, it says here in James verse 13, thir chapter 3, verse 13, that we'll have a that we will know those who have wisdom will know it by their good life and by the deeds done in my version or in the enemy it says in humility, but in um, many words there it says in the meekness of wisdom. So James uses this meekness of wisdom. And so we as we unpacked what is understanding of what is meekness, the meekness of wisdom, I believe it's, it will help us attend, okay, where is our motivation? Where is the, the motivation for us seeking after wisdom, for us seeking after more knowledge? It's possible, I believe, for us to be educated, but yet be an educated fool. To be educated, but yet be a fool. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, it says that knowledge, actually, knowledge can puff us up and can make us full of pride. And if we are full of pride, then we understand and we'll see in James in the next, uh, actually it'll probably be two weeks, it'll be the baby dedication on the, on the 23rd, but we'll be talking about uh, the opposition of God. So if we are full of pride, we're in actually opposition of God and of others. So the chapter 1 in James, we found that the wisdom to, to get gospel wisdom, to, to have the gospel in our life, to have Jesus in our life, the, the first prerequisite for uh, getting this wisdom from God is to understand or to get to the point that we can admit we need wisdom. So in, in order to that is a complete opposition to pride. Because we say, actually, I am in lack of something. So to approach God and to say, if we're going to be at this pursuit of wisdom, we're saying, first of all, for the, to get this godly wisdom, the first step in it, the prerequisite, James said in chapter 1, and again, uh, emphasizing this meekness of wisdom, is to understand that I don't have it. That's a hard, that's a hard thing sometimes, right? 21, it says that the, 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 the prerequisite, prerequisite in uh, James chapter 1, verse 21, says the prerequisite is to receive gospel wisdom, is to recognize that we need it that we don't have it, and that we have to look outside of ourselves to get it. Specifically, if we're talking about the church this morning, we're talking about godly wisdom, it's saying, hey, I don't have what it takes to live like this list says, to live peacefully, to live pure, to live in consideration of others, to live submissively and full of mercy. I don't have the ability to do that. I need somebody else. It says, I need, I need Christ. I need the person and the work of Christ to come and to do this in my life. See, the heart of meekness is not equal weakness. The so meekness here, or the humility of wisdom, it doesn't mean weak. But, it, I, I would like this definition, but it's putting yourself in humble submission to God and acceptance of the circumstances you find yourself in. To put yourself in humble submission to God. It's not a resignation to fate. It's not a woe is me. It's not, oh, I can't. Oh, oh. It's not any of those things, but it's a full submission to who God is. Did Jesus demonstrate this right in Philippians chapter 2? We know that familiar verse. He, being equal with God, considered it not something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. So it wasn't that Jesus was nothing. He was actually something. He had power. He had authority. He was that of the nature of God. But he put that in submission. He became meek in order to fulfill the purpose of God. So what happens here? We know this familiar story of Adam and Eve when they go and they've been given all authority in heaven. They have been given all authority to go and to rule and to, to govern over the land and to take control and to, to, to name all the, all the animals. And, and they have been given dominion over the earth, right? And we, we know the familiar story that, that Eve goes and she eats the fruit. What would, what, if, what would have been different if Eve in this moment exhibited meekness instead of pride? Right? She doesn't believe that God is good. She doesn't believe the, the, um, the rule that he has given was something that she should live by. But instead she believed that evil. She saw the fruit and said, and it says this, that it was useful to become wise. It was useful to be able to do her own thing. 
to, to be able to do it apart from God, to take a pride in what she, what she was able to do and to become something outside of the submission to who God is. That wasn't wisdom and meekness. She thought it was useful to her wife and took matters in her own hands. See, that's the moment where there's this contrast between um, heavenly wisdom, godly wisdom, and earthly wisdom. Is this moment of decision, am I going to make it in my own hands, or am I going to submit myself to God's hands and to His direction in my life? Instead of meekness and submitting to God, she wanted radical independence instead of dependence on God. So this moment, what if, if I'm trying, trying to decide, what am I going after? Am I going after worldly uh, wisdom? Am I going after godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom in my life? Am, am I going and seeking uh, radical independence, my own way, my own thought pattern? Or am I think, depending completely on God and everything that I do in my life is through that lens? How, how would God see me living this out? Think about your pursuit of knowledge or wisdom. Is it so you can say, I don't really need anybody? I can learn this task, and when I learn this task, then I won't have to depend on anybody around me, because then I'll be able to do it myself. Or is it in a position of one that is full of peace and love, that is considered of other people, I, I want to know this, that way I can help others out, that I can lift them up, that I can build them up. So do, is it that we want to be a, a city that, that starts new initiative all the time? Is it because, hey, we're thinking about the others and how this new initiative can bless others around me? Or is it because, hey, I want to be my own boss, and so I know if I start my own company, I can be my own boss, and then I won't have to rely on, and nobody can tell me what to do, and I can just do my own thing. And there's two, two things. They're still starting a good initiative. They're still doing something good in the, the community, right? But there's a different heart in both of those things. Are we looking outside of God for our purposes? How do we seek to find purpose in our life? Does it show meekness and wanting to find God's way? God, what do you have for me to do? How, how is your plan for my life going to un unfold? What is, I love, um, Richard is downstairs with the kids this morning, but he's been uh, coming to Missional Community and he's been uh, asking us questions like, I've been asking God, what's my work? What is what does he want me to do? Like I know I'm I know I'm an I, the IT guy, you know. But he, he's like, what does God want me to do? What is the work? Do we have that same heart, that passion, that that leads towards a, a right purpose, a right motive? God, what is your plan? What is your work? How do you want this to play out in my life? Not this thought of independence, because oftentimes we find, and I find myself, I rather have self rule instead of submission. Yes. I'd rather do it my way. I'd rather make it, it's going to be easier if I figure it out myself. Yeah. Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's not the fear that God is scary, that he's like, oh, going to crack down on me at any moment. But no, it's in awe of God. It's a, wow, God, you have a plan. Wow, God, you are all wise. You are all knowing. It's, it's that kind of awe, that kind of fear that leads to wisdom. Because it's a recognition that he's greater and, and I'm less. And, and you know what? That's a good thing. That he has it all in control. That he has all of the knowledge. He has an understanding that, that every breath that I have is not uh, my own doing, it's not my own breath, but it's a gift from God. It's a recognition, hey, he has a plan, he's, he's, he, he can direct every footstep that I have in my life. Amen. When we come to him, we get to know how awesome and amazing he is. That he's worthy of me submitting my life to him. He's worthy of me asking him of wisdom, that, that he has it all in order. And when I study him and I interact with him more and, and through his word and through song and through prayer, man, it, it changes me and it begins to, to show me, wow, he's somebody I can live for. And it moves us and it should lead us towards meekness. There's no one better to live a life full of wisdom than Jesus himself. 
And so I said, wow, I want him more and more and more. So pride in the heart is the center of worldly wisdom. You see that again in verse 14. But if your heart, but if you harbor bitter envy or selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. So this pride element, uh, James is speaking to us, this pride element is the element of, I want to do it myself, that I can figure it out, that I want to educate myself, and I want to pursue wisdom for my selfish gain. Yeah. He said that's at the heart of worldly wisdom. The pride wants us to avoid God at all costs. That I can do it without Him. That, that sense of, I can, do it without, I can do it without consulting God. I can do it, make this grand decision for my family. Uh, I can make this grand decision for myself without consulting who, who God is or what, what He wants for our life. But, again, we want to say, what is heavenly wisdom? What is, uh, what is the opposition of, of this worldly wisdom that causes such discord in my life? So the first thing is, we've got to examine why we want wisdom. Why do we want knowledge? What is our pursuit? And examine our hearts, know it. The second, uh, secondly, is we want to know what it produces. What is the knowledge, what is, what is our pursuit of wisdom? What is it producing? Is it producing life? Yes. James, uh, chapter, uh, James here in uh, chapter 3, verse 14 and and 15, let's read it again. It says, But if you harbor bitterness, envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder or discord in and every evil practice. Wow, well, I don't want to. I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want broken relationships. I don't, I don't, I don't want that. And if he's a discord or, or, or an order in my life, right? So what does it produce? We can see this playing out in our lives. For example, what does this produce? What, what is pro being produced in my life? Give us a little direction. Give us a little examination of what wisdom are we living by? Godly wisdom says, I don't, I don't have enough. I want more. It leads me to this. My ways are still broken. God, I want more of you. Amen. I need more of you. That's my heart's cry. I need your direction. Evidence of earthly wisdom will be broken relationships, disorder, and division. Mm -hmm. The ambition, wanting to create, like I said earlier, ambition, the initiative that we have, especially in the, in the city, a young city full of great uh, education and knowledge, right? Ambition and initiative, those are, those are good things. But we want to be careful is where we're saying, is it for myself, for self-promotion and defiance of God and at the cost of others? Or is it to bring life to those who are around me? Is it in defiance of God and at the cost of others? Or is it to bring life to others? Sometimes we get in the trouble of, of, of thinking this way, but we always kind of say, say this, does the, does the, uh, does the, all right. In the process of going after and pursuing ourselves, does the end justify the means of us going after this? Does it, does it reflect who God is? Bitter jealousy, this uh, scripture here says, bitter, bitter jealous, jealousy or bitter envy and selfish ambition. Bitter jealousy means a sharpness of spirit in a person or relationships. An over-concern for one's own position or dignity or rights. A sharpness of self-interest that easily leads into the formation of parties or cliques. Alright, so this, this um, bitter envy, this bitter jealousy, this selfish ambition, it, it leads towards a clique. It leads towards segmenting the family. And we say, hey, we, we want to be a family. We want to be, uh, we are a family. I, we don't want to be, we are a family. 
right. and a family loves, no matter who comes in, no matter what is going on in a, in a other's life, a family loves, a family is considerate. But if we have this bitter jealousy at work in our lives, we will begin to see, if we begin to be honest with ourselves, we will see, hey, our relationships have been fractured, our relationships are torn apart, that we're actually causing, we're living by worldly wisdom because we're creating parties or we're creating cliques instead of bringing unity which is something that the body of Christ is to represent. This heavenly wisdom, not yeah. worldly wisdom. Again, what leads to division, what leads to this, this, this discord is when we are beginning to think only of ourselves. We went over this a couple weeks ago, but that love is to think about my greatest, uh, to think about whatever I want the greatest for myself, for others. We want to do that for the other. I want to be a family that speaks wisely to one another. That we speak to people, and whenever we're speaking about people, we're building each other up. Right? That we speak to one another, and whenever we find ourselves speaking about somebody else in the family of God, or in, in our personal family, whenever we're talking about somebody else, we're always building them up. We're lifting them up. Whenever we're talking down, whenever, because immediately, whenever we're talking down, or whenever we're putting our ways above somebody else, is an immediate sign that there's pride in our heart. Consider the results of worldly wisdom. Not only does James paint this picture, but again, we can examine the story of Adam and Eve. What was the result of Eve saying, hey, I want to do it my own way, I want to do it my own thing? And it resulted in running away, covering herself, hiding, and blame. Right? Immediately after, this, they're in the garden, they have this great peaceable living life where God was with them and there was fellowship. And immediately after, she uh, decided to go her own way, and then also uh, Adam followed suit, went his own way. And then immediately after, there was running away, there was covering up, there was hiding, and there was blame. Right? And, and, and we can examine this in our own life, right? Whenever we, uh, we're living in, in worldly wisdom, wherever we're living for ourselves, all of a sudden we, we're running away. We, we don't want to be near people, right? We want to get away from them because, hey, we don't want them really to know us, right? We want to cover up who we really are. We don't want people to see in. We want to isolate ourselves. We're, we're hiding. We're, we're blaming them. Hey, it wasn't, it, it's not my fault that this is happening in my life. Hey, it was because my parents. I didn't have great parents, so this is produced in my life. We're, we're blaming the situation in our, our families or the workplace situation or, or anybody else. We, we want to yeah. push it all away, right? That's right. This is, the, this is the result of worldly wisdom, living for ourselves, living in pride. We blame others, we hide, we don't let people in, we don't want people to know us. And what does this always produce? Always produce broken relationships. If we're going to be, uh, if we are a family that has strong relationships, a church that has strong relationships, we have to allow people to know who we are. Let us in. Open up. Hey, what's going on? I, I, I stopped settling for, yeah, my week was great or my week was good. You know, we can't, we can't stop there. Because selfish ambition, uh, worldly wisdom would say the best thing to do would be guard myself and not let anybody in. It, it's a self-preservation uh, self kind of mode that we live in. Opposite of it's the opposite of heavenly wisdom. It's opposite of, of, of what God would have us to do. Does your pursuit of wisdom look more like Adam and Eve, and the consequences of their pride? Does, does the way I'm living my life? Do I not allow people in? Do do all of it, are the relationships around me are they broken? Are, uh, do I find myself alone? Do, what, what's going on? Godly relationships are strong as we allow ourselves to be open up to see who we really are. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was listening to a friend of mine speak on this subject, and he was talking about a moment where uh, he found himself in the midst of worldly wisdom and found himself 
seeing godly wisdom being called out to them. And, you know, as a teenager, we all are living defiance of our parents, probably. Or we're trying to figure out our, our own, uh, who we are, and, and something that leads to, to selfish thoughts and selfish actions. So there's a moment where he was talking about being in an argument with his, with his family. And he was arguing with his mother, and, and, his, and he told his mother, you know, he just wants to move out and leave. And so his mother actually was a, a very a very godly woman, and in the moment of all this arguing, he, he was reminded of all the times that he's walked in on her praying and, and all this stuff, but he just had enough, and he was going to leave. And so he said, all right, here's the, his mother told him, here's a suitcase, you can go. So as a, you know, really independent teenager, he packed his suitcase, and went across the street to his friend's house. <laughs> yeah. But he's down in the basement with his friend, and, and they're talking, and you know, two teenage guys talking about how terrible their, their parents are. And, you know, and hey, if they just didn't have them, they could go live their life, and they could just go do their own thing, and oh, it's just so, so terrible, right? But then in this moment, and in this, you know, great moments of independence, he went across the street and went to his friend's basement to live. <laughs> so, far. His, so far away. His mother comes to the house. And he, he, his friend's mother comes to the basement door and calls down, Hey, come on up here. Your mother's here. His mother actually comes to the basement door and he <coughs> calls out to him and asks forgiveness and says, I'm sorry that I told you to leave. Would you come back? Would you return to the home? Would you forgive me? And in this moment, he says that it was, it, it was this moment where wisdom, godly wisdom, was crying out to him. A complete picture of opposite sides going here. Worldly wisdom, hey, I want to do my own thing. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm getting on the road. Godly wisdom coming and being full of mercy. Giving, gentle. In Proverbs, it says that wisdom cries out in the street. Wisdom is calling from the gospel today and is asking us to come and to receive from it. In James chapter 3, let's look at 17. Wisdom that comes from heaven is first pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Last week, again, we talked about our relationships and described a relationship that when we treat others, we should treat others in the, in the person in Jesus' disguise. Jesus' disguise in the person that we're interacting with. You know, I talk with different people and mentor people through different pornography issues and things of that nature. And I have to ask the question, you know, why do we uh, objectify people? Why do we use people for their own means? It's because we're living in worldly wisdom. We're going to living in selfish ambition. And when we begin to recognize that, we can then seek after this next part, right? Seek after godly wisdom. Seek after love. How do we do this? How do we change our speech? How do we change our heart? How do we change ourselves? Like we've been so long in this mode that I'm doing it myself, that I'm capable and I'm able and I've done it, to now living a life that is, like James says, full of meekness, full of submission. One, we've got to fight for relationships. We've got to fight for relationships. If in worldly wisdom, things are all for myself, so hey, if I lose a relationship, it's okay. But no, as a God, the one that is full of godly wisdom, we fight for a relationship. If, if we don't have the motivation in ourselves to do it, we look to Christ and see how Christ fights for us. That he's on our, on our side, that he's for us, and he's on our behalf. He's fighting for us. He's, as Pastor encouraged us this morning, that he's praying right now at the, seat, at the side of the Father. And he's praying for us, and he's interceding for us. He's fighting that we would make it. Yeah. If we're going to be ones that are full of godly wisdom, full of, of heavenly wisdom in our life, we're going to be ones that we're going to be fighting for relationships, fighting for unity, going at whatever it's going to take. I'm going to learn how to make this thing right. Mm -hmm. Gentle tenderness, the tenderness 
wins one another over in the way that we speak and the way that we love. When I was talking uh, recently, we've been going through a couple classes. Those in our mission community knows uh, maybe I'm a little tired of it, but we, we the last two Saturdays uh, we spent eight hours learning about uh, the children that we'll be adopting this summer. And so as I'm hearing about all these different situations, it's it's really painful to hear about all of the stories of, of these children and what they've gone through and that led them to be at this point of needing to be adopted. And I think in this moment, and, and, I, and I'm examining myself, and, and if, if, if I'm honest, I'm like, this sounds like a huge task. It's like uh, all these stories of brokenness. But if I look at this passage, it says, man, one that is full of mercy, consider it. I, I want to I wanna be that for these children, to bring wholeness into their lives. We should have that same thought towards one another. We talked about last week, I mentioned that people are just, uh, that are, they are Jesus in disguise. When we're interacting with people in their brokenness, we're, we're seeing Jesus in, in disguise. And so when we see, when, I, when I'm learning about these children, when you think about your children, when you think about your coworkers, your neighbors, those difficult people in your life, are we going to be in selfish ambition, just push them out? It's going to, it'll be easier to push them out and to do my own thing. God says, no, you're going to be one full of mercy. You're going to share with them the love of Christ. I can't do it my own, but I look to Jesus because he's my strength. He's the example of one that takes something that is worthless, something that is messy, and he finds value in it. And so if he can do that for me, then I can reciprocate that to the world around me. If Jesus, can, can, who is equal with God, can, can push that aside for the sake of coming and, and bringing life to the world, man, I can forget about who I am and all my likes and dislikes, right? And sometimes, right now, I'm, I'm struggling with going to work every day, and, and I've been given different uh, authorities at work, but then the, I still have a, a boss, and, and sometimes I tend to walk into different meetings we meet every Thursday, and get together with the different managers and we're talking together. You know, and oftentimes I walk in there and I feel like I, I'm the one that's right and that they're wrong. Like, I, I got all the answers and they need to learn from me more than I need to learn from them. Do we find this playing out in our own lives too? You walk into a room and say, hey, immediately, you know, I, everybody in this room is wrong. I got all the answers. Everybody needs to learn from me. Right? When somebody confronts me, or when somebody confronts you and says, hey, there's something wrong in your life, there's something off going on, do you immediately think that, no, actually I'm right, and you need to convince other people around you that actually you're good and they're the ones that are in the wrong? Do we find this playing out in our lives? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah, let's be honest this morning. We do find this playing out. It is impossible that there is nothing wrong with us. <laughs> it's impossible. I always say this, but I wrote it again. The hardest thing about being deceived is that we don't even know that we're wrong. When you're deceived, you don't even know it. That's why we need the body. That's why we can't be ones that hide, that, that run away, that, that blame other people, that, that do, because, because if we do, then we don't even know, then we'll never know what's going on. The Holy Spirit uses the body of Christ to speak to one another so we can see into each other's life, and not so that we can be prideful and look down upon them and hold condemnation against them, but that we can build them up in love. That's right. That we can build each other up, that we can lift each other up. That's not who we are. That's, that's not what we do. Come on. Look at Jesus. He's an example. Could we be living in worldly wisdom and not even know it? Could we be creating distance between us and God and us and others around us? Wisdom says, I don't know it all. I need God and others to speak into my life. 
we would be living in worldly wisdom, not even know it, creating distance between God and others. Wisdom said, I don't know it all, and I need God and others to speak into my life. Wisdom is full of mercy. It's eager to forgive. It doesn't hold wrongs. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't hold wrongs. You know, and when I find myself living in worldly wisdom, I find myself not wanting to forgive. Because if I don't forgive somebody, then I have something to hold against them. And I can actually take a position of authority over them and condemn them for what they've done wrong. And I can hold it above them, whatever they've held against me. But in godly wisdom, we say, you know what? In meekness, I forgive you. I release you from that wrong. Because we understand I've been in that same position in Christ who had the ability to condemn me. Chose love instead. Christ had every right to condemn me. The Father has every right to hold these things against me. But instead, he chose mercy. Godly wisdom does not keep a, a record of wrong, but is eager to extend grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Yes. And it's full of good fruit. It doesn't discriminate. It is sincere. It is loving. It is peaceful. It brings unity. Do these words describe how we relate to God? Or how we relate to others? Pure, peaceful, gentle, open to reason, mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Alright, so I know at this point in the sermon, I was the same way, I'm preparing all this, and I was just like, this feels really heavy. And so I don't think we need to convince, I don't think we need to go any farther in convincing us of the evidence of our worldly wisdom that we've been living by. Right? We, we're broken people. And I know in my life I've, I've produced some brokenness. There's evidence of it. i got some relationships that are, need to be worked out. i got some things that, that I need to create some peace in. I, 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 I can see it. You see it this morning? I love the Holy Spirit. I say this often. I love the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I love when He speaks truth to me. I hope we also get in that mode. I love it. God when you show me that I'm not like you. So where do we go to get godly wisdom? Maybe this is the hard part for us being a city that's full of knowledge and education and ability. We can't create this kind of wisdom. We can't like it's not something we can like do a training course on. Here's how to have godly wisdom. You know why? Because this wisdom only comes from above. It's heavenly in nature. It's not something we can create or develop, strengthen my muscle. Right? It's a gift from God. This wisdom is granted to us in the gospel. When we come before God, as James said in chapter 1, when we admit, I don't have it. That's, remember what we said? That's a prerequisite. The prerequisite to receiving this wisdom is to say, I don't have it. And I need it, which you give me wisdom. And it said that if we ask of him anything, especially, and James says, when we ask him of wisdom, he grants it. He gives it. It's not something we can work on. It's not something that we can create. It's something that we get from above. It's from the heavenly realm. And what's so amazing about the New Testament revelation is that the heavenly realm is now open to us. All the things that are in heaven, now we have with us. It says that we should fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross for us. That we, when we fix our eyes on Him, then we receive from Him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, it says Jesus is the wisdom of God. So it's on the, how, do, how should I live? How should I live my life? How, what is this, how do I live a, a way that is full of wisdom, full of heavenly wisdom, instead of earthly wisdom? I fix my eyes on Jesus, who is the wisdom of God who lived a wise life that was gospel-centered. The kingdom of God is given to us. 
Jesus said, the kingdom, I, I give you the kingdom. The kingdom of God is given to us. We can experience another life right now, right here, on this earth, on this planet, in Madison, in your city, in your home. We can experience this. Because Jesus went to the cross, where wisdom went to the cross in exchange for our foolishness. Think about it. Wisdom went to the cross in place for our foolishness, for our, my mistake, for my selfishness. Jesus submitted himself for my sake. Not only did he go to the cross and die for our sins, but he rose again on the third day and now sits at the right hand of the Father with power and authority and victory and gives us the power to be walked. It gives us the power and the ability to walk in heavenly wisdom. Jesus is eternal and he's in the heavenly realm and he's been given to give us that same ability. We have all of him. We are co-heirs with Christ. Yes. So when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we believe that he died for our sins, that he granted us forgiveness, that he rose again on the third day, and he washed away all the sins that are against us, and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, when we believe this, all that is in Jesus, all that he has done, all that he has lived, is for us. Amen. It's ours in the heavenly realm. It's Amen. our inheritance. Paul says it in Ephesians 1, 3, that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm is ours. It's been given to us. So we want wisdom? Look to Jesus and say, Jesus, give me that wisdom. Yeah. I need heavenly wisdom. I'm tired of doing it myself. My concern is that we are living so much for ourselves and we're being comfortable with that. spiritual blessing is ours. So this morning, I think we recognize here that we've been living for worldly wisdom that's been producing some stuff in our lives. But what's amazing with God is that there's a great exchange. That what He has has been given to us. This morning, I want to ask us to respond. To respond to this message and saying, God, I need your wisdom. I need from you wisdom. Jesus, I saw your life. Jesus, you were so reasonable. You were so loving. You were so considerate. You, you were so kind. You were so uh, lived as such a servant. Jesus, you did it all. Jesus, I need that in me. That's you this morning. I want to invite you to stand. Say, I need wisdom. Remember, the prerequisite to receiving wisdom is saying, I need it. Recognizing I can't do it myself. I need wisdom. And this morning, I want to invite you to come to the front. This is the place that we can come and we can pray and seek God. And what's the difference from where I'm at in my seat and coming up here? There's not a lot of difference, even in distance. But when we come before him, I, I say it's, it's, it's an act of my heart. It's an act towards God saying, God, I, I'm coming to you. So though God is right there where you're at, he's up here too. And by coming forward, we're saying, hey, I, God, I'm coming to you to receive from you this wisdom. I need it. I need it. I recognize it this morning. I need you. I need wisdom. This morning, I'm going to pray. And if you... Uh, I just want to say if you feel comfortable. I don't even want, if you don't feel, if you need to be up here. We need to come forward. Even if it's uncomfortable for you, we need to approach God. And when we approach Him, He'll meet us. And He'll give to us exactly what we're asking for. So I'm going to pray and respond to Him this morning by coming forward and saying, God, I need wisdom. Father, I pray this morning, I first of all thank you for your word that continues to shape us and to mold us and to make us look more like you. 
God, this morning, if anything, I recognize I need wisdom. I can't do it on my own. In my own efforts, Father, there's been destruction, there's been discord, there's been all sorts of mess. And this morning I recognize that I can come to you and you will give me wisdom. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will begin the work of changing our hearts, that we will be ones that are full of mercy, that are loving, that are long-suffering, Father, that are, that are peacemakers. Because we know that's what represents you. That's what you were for us. So Father, as we come before you today, Father, fill us with heavenly wisdom. Remove from us selfish ambition. So Father, now fill us with your wisdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.